feaster. And I have been curator at the Farlow uh, Library and Herbarium for many years. And in looking at this event, I realized that this is the 39th year of the Friends of the Farlow. And I wanted to say a little bit about the Friends of the Farlow because uh, not only is it 39 years that we've been doing this, but the Friends have really been important in developing and helping uh, within the context of our uh, mission. Uh, the, um, the Friends have provided sources of funding for almost 50 uh, graduate students who have come and visited. Uh, there have been visiting scholars, any number of people who uh, the Friends have supported over the years. And it's uh, been a really important part of being able to continue the operations and also to see that the, uh, the collections are being used. I, I know we have some old friends as well as new friends here. Uh, let me just say a little bit about the Farlow Library and Herbarium. Uh, there are about 70,000 items in the library and the collection includes items on fungi, of course, but also lichens, which are also fungi, bryophytes, and algae. Uh, the total uh, number of specimens for the collection is about a million and a half. So this is a large, large collection uh, that is very rich in all sorts of material from all parts of the world. So uh, with the help of the friends, we've been able to bring people in to study these and to work on these groups. So it's been a really important, uh, important aspect. And I, I guess I could sound like uh, public radio. Uh, it's made possible because of viewers like you. So thank you. I, it is great to be able to introduce Juliana Furci. Juliana, uh, I've known for a number of years. And uh, she has aided me in many ventures, uh, particularly studying the fungi in temperate South America. We've spent time in the field, and she's spent time with me in the uh, collection studying and learning about fungi. She was one of the students who participated a year ago when I did my biology of fungi class completely online. Uh, and we had a, a great time. It was great to have her there. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, she is the author of two field guides for uh, South America, for uh, Chile. And those field guides are illustrated with wonderful, wonderful photographs. And those are photographs of her own. I, I always think of Juliana in the field with her camera. It's with her all the time, photographing uh, fungi and people and landscapes and birds. Uh, everything is fair game for Juliana. I, she's really been encouraging and helpful in any number of, of projects. Uh, of course, her she's best known uh, probably for her work uh, with the a uh, fungus foundation, the Fundacion Fungi. And uh, she founded this NGO. Uh, it's now very prominent in the world of um, mycology. And uh, certainly it's all been her ambition and her drive that's allowed this to, to flourish. So just a, a wonderful uh, legacy that she has. And I will say that she's led the drive uh, for fungi to have equal status with plants and with animals in conservation efforts. Uh, and this is really now caught on. And th this is part of the topic that she's going to talk about, the three Fs, fungi, funga, flora, and fauna. 
And this has caught on. And it, it's uh, really Juliana's uh, work that's made that possible. So without talking too much more, let me uh, make sure that I invite you to come to the Farlow uh, at some point. We are more or less open these days. Uh, it's a wonderful place and uh, full of resources for studying fungi. So Juliana, do you want to share your screen and, and start? And, and thank you so much for doing oh, this. This is really you. Been wonderful. Thank you very much. Wonderful opportunity for us. Thank you very much, Don. And thank you very much to everybody. I have to start by saying that my days at the Farlow, I consider with, with Teresita and with Don, um, some of the happiest days of my life. So thank you very much and very, very special. Okay, here we go. So um, as Don said, I'm going to talk about the 3F initi initiative, and I'm going to make sure that you're all saying the F word that not very many are saying, um, but we all have to say this F word. So um, the this first, I'd like to start by um, acknowledging the artist who um, is responsible for many of the graphics in this presentation. Her name is Bola Heredia. She is, uh, this is part of her um, graduate, undergraduate project to become a graphic designer. And so we took her on at the foundation um, to help her uh, have some applications of her graphic design in the real world. Um, and so Bola Heredia is the artist of these wonderful slides. And this is Amanita Galactica, a beautiful um, Gondwan and Amanita that I'd like to start um, just by by talking a bit about the Fungi Foundation. The Fungi Foundation is a is an NGO, as Don mentioned, born in Chile. We're almost 10 years old and we've um, been a foundation in the US for over a year um, in the state of New York. Very thankful um, for being the first environmental NGO in Chile that is opened in the US and not the other way around. We have many um, North American NGOs in our country and South America has a lot of help from North American NGOs and we're happy to revert that trend as well and make it happen the other way. And the Fungi Foundation is an organization that works in a very mycelial way. Um, we, uh, we work with different areas um, of research, education, uh, conservation, uh, manage and sort of expedition and working with ethnomycology around the world. This is an overview of our um, of our global map uh, that really guides us towards achievements that we plan two years in advance. Um, on our board, there are um, mycologists actors and actresses, uh, winemakers, people from different parts of the world that help us move forward to achieve um, all of these goals that, that are planned. But what I'm going to talk about today in particular is the conservation program. And in that conservation program, we have um, three sort of main areas of, of work. One is red listing and promoting the red listing of fungi through the IUCN um, criteria for red listing, which basically evaluates the probability of extinction of fungal species around the world. There are national red lists and there's also a global red list. We have a, a part, a, a, a line of work inside the conservation program that works to find the mycological um, arguments and reasons to protect old growth forests around the world. And we have a line of work that um, really is focused on achieving equal consideration and equal acknowledgement, equal naming of fungi um, to plants and animals when referring to macroscopic diversity on earth in conservation frameworks and biodiversity planning around the world. Now, we've worked in different countries over the last uh, decade or so, but our work, as you see, has mainly been focused in Chile. And in Chile, until very recently, we were best known for having triggered 
as an NGO, as a nonprofit, the inclusion of fungi in environmental legislation. So in the year 2000, um, 2010, the work began to finally, to, to, to start the consideration by part on the part of decision makers of including fungi in the general law um, that establishes the basis for the, um, the environment, how we treat the environment in the country. It's a constitutional law, it's the highest legislative level in the country. And the year 2012, fungi were acknowledged in this legislation in two articles of, a par of, of one of the paragraphs, many paragraphs of the law. But basically what it um, translated into was that we had to create as a country regulations that would ensure um, that fungi were considered when giving environmental permits. So um, every environmental impact assessment has to include a fungal baseline study as, as well as a you know, plant baseline study and animal baseline study that we're the only country that has that mandated in our law, in our law. And that's from the Atacama Desert all the way to the, the ice fields of, of Patagonia. And some of the other requirements include that there has to be a national inventory of species and that species of fungi have to be included in national um, red listing processes and and really acknowledging the existence of fungi in species um, inventories for Chile. Now this had been until the beginning of this year I think really sort of our, our, our biggest achievement in terms of, of conservation and paving a way forward for fungal conservation uh, on a global global level but what I want to talk to you um, about today is um is is about another initiative and, and as i mentioned before so the, the the policy that i was talking about for chile came into effect on december 24th in 2013 so virtually now you know it's got it's nine years of um of mandatory inclusion of fungi in legislation but we all know here, people, all of us here in this presentation, that fungi are critical to human, eco human ecosystem and planetary well-being, and it's time to include them within, within conservation frameworks. Now, this looks beautiful, you know, on, on a slide and on paper, and it sounds wonderful, um, but getting this done has, it has proved to be a challenge, and the way as a as an organization that we've been able to uh, undertake this challenge is by cooperating collaborating forming symbiosis with different people and organizations around the world um, so from this statement this statement that very few could argue against comes it begs the question and excuse me if I overstep but what's going on right where are the fungi they're not anywhere in regulation they're not in um, mentions of international policy climate policy you know food policies nowhere and so this is what really led us to move forward and um and and consider um, fungal conservation, a specific program for the foundation, and one of our most important endeavors for the for this year and um, at least two or three years to come. Now, we know that you know the best estimate suggests that there are uh, between two point two and three point eight million species, and we know and and. Um, we're, we're, I'm very honoured to have uh, Meredith on this presentation. We know that it could be many, many more. Um, but of all these species, only 358 have had their conservation um, priority assessed with the IUCN Red List. And the IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is the largest NGO, on, environmental NGO on Earth. And it's the NGO that informs policymakers around the world and international fora on what to do to, to, to make sure that species don't go extinct and for habitats to be protected and for uses of species to be protected, etc. Now, these 358 species of fungi um, 
that have been assessed are in comparison with over 76,000 species of animals and over 44,000 species of plants. So if we take this to the math, really um, fungi in fact only represent 0.2% of our global conservation priorities. So really the question is, where are they? That, what, that WTF is, is a sincere one. Where are the fungi here? And this um, had been really you know, floating in 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 my um, I wouldn't say my my head or heart. It was in it was in my gut. It was I was very angry about this. I've been I've been actually quite um, infuriated by this for, for for many many years, and it was that I would say anger probably that led me to um, ask um, fellow colleagues from Argentina from um, Brazil and with the help of Don um, as, as a mentor for this project I would say um, to really put together this paper that was published in 2018 that delimits the term funga as a valid term to when we refer to a community of fungi in a given place. Now what's the difference between fungi and funga? We'll, we'll get to it in, in a short moment but basically Funga that we many of us know of for many years, so that the wonderful publication of fun Funga Nordica that so many of us have used over the years and, and other, um, other um, uses of this word that resonate when studying fungi. It's an artific artificial linguistic construction that is very clearly analogous to fauna and flora. And it's based on the word fungus, of course, which derives from the Greek sphongos. But the, the choice of proposing a 3F um, approach to uh, really a 3F strategy to get fungi included was based, and, and this is written in 2018, um, that the use of the 3Fs will be overarching in international assemblies, um, such as IUCN and on um, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. But what it really would do was, was provoke a very simple and catchy way of, um, of pushing for fungal inclusion um, in, in all these frameworks that govern how we relate and how we protect and where we allocate funding um, for nature. So the 3F uh, proposal was an incredible endeavor that led me to uh, the Farlow um, where Don very kindly said well, let's pull up the books and we went and even saw you know Linnaeus's original works and of course I had to um, keep my tears back so that not even a speck of that um, would, would ever, and Judy, if you're there, well, I didn't cry over the books. We didn't touch them either. But um, we searched and searched and searched. And what we found was that um, in the cover of this 1774 uh, Schaefer um, publication, there was a depiction of the goddess Diana or Artemisa um, who, in, who who represents abundance and fertility um, and is normally adorned with with plants but in this case was adorned with well at first I thought were puffballs but actually no it, it, they are the nine breasts that she has even when she has flowers but it, what it seems to be um, chanterelles and and, and uh, but definitely all uh, basidio mycota mushrooms now this is um, one of the, 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 in letter B is the uh, illustration of part of letter A, if you can see at the bottom left hand side, she's there, Diana Funga, and there are carabins with baskets and carabins, you know, holding mushrooms. But this is the earliest depiction we could find of any um, representation of a uh, sort of mythical or um, historical figure associated with fungi. So we like to call her Diana Funga and she very rapidly became uh, well known in different places just because of this, you know, first being the first representation. And thank you Don and thank you um, everybody at the Farlow for, for having us help find her too. I'm sorry that went 
the wrong way. Okay, so what's the difference? So fungi, as we know, uh, we, we, we know to name the kingdom, but fungi is the, the fungal diversity of a given place, just like fauna is the diversity of animals of a given place and flora the diversity of plants of a given place. So we would say the fungi of Massachusetts um, uh, that are the organisms of kingdom fungi that are found in Massachusetts. Now mycobiota and mycota are also correct and they are rooted linguistically probably in a stronger fashion than funga but it but the term so to propose that wherever the two f's flora and fauna were included for it to be flora fauna and mycobiota or flora fauna and funga um really there was a big difference and in our experience with having achieved inclusion of fungi in chile we knew that it had to be catchy it had to be straight to the point it had to be something simple to replace and the 3f proposal was a lot more appropriate to achieve the incorporation of fungi in these global conservation frameworks so what we also know is that mycoflora please no it is totally incorrect to refer to um, mycobiota or to the fungi of a place is the mycoflora. Flora is specific to the kingdom of plants and I'm very proud that it was this paper and our work that um, helped the once North American mycoflora project to become the fungal diversity survey. I think they were the first to transition to mycologically inclusive language um, and funga is the term that we should all be embracing. Now with that as a basis, once again, different country uh, representatives and people from different countries came together in a beautiful symbiosis to push this into conservation frameworks. At the beginning, of, so at the end of last year, I'm sorry, time is a bit difficult to keep track of in this pandemic, but it was at the end of last year, Merlin Sheldrake, who is a British biologist, um, that wrote the marvelous book Entangled Life, uh, published a an article in The Guardian. And in his article, he mentions at the end that there's this foundation called the Fungi Foundation that is put, that has had had some success in Chile and that's an organization pushing for the inclusion of fungi in conservation frameworks. And that article was read by this Colombian gentleman on the right of my screen, I think of your screen too. Uh, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who is a professor um, of clinical law, and he's he's the he's the director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU School of Law, and Cesar reached out to me and said, you know, I just read this incredible um, op-ed by Merlin in the Guardian, and I read about your work, and I really want to. Um, partner and see what we can do to further this mission of getting fungi included into um, legislation in, on an international level. And so this is the, the work began. We invited Merlin on board and the three of us began a road that is still um, very much um, transited upon where we've been working to find the legal um, avenues to get fungi considered. Now, um, what the first thing that we decided to do was draft a statement, a statement that would be circulated among different people, would be, um, pe we would have thousands of people invited to sign on to this statement. And once that was ready, we would come out with a, a sort of a, a powerful um, manifesto uh, um, that would help us really get a toe in the door to have, you know, to have decision makers, legislators, countries listen to us with this proposal of getting the three F's to replace the two F's. Now, once again, the three F's takes on some relevance because instead of asking and people very clearly understanding the reasons, what after listening to an explanation what most decision makers delegates you know country rep representatives remember is that it's three f's and not two and so despite the fact that um the term funga might not be 
as appropriate linguistically as mycota or mycobiota, it really has, um, it catches on much quicker for, for, for these people to, to, um, to engage with the proposal. Now we know that fungi have very long supported life and, and a rich life on our planet. And, and this really was the basis of the manifesto that it was time now for fungi to be recognized within these conservation frameworks and that they had to be protected on an equal footing with plants and animals. And we created this website, faunaflorafunga.org we presented the 3F initiative that's based on the, the 3F proposal in, in the paper. And really what we do is investigate the legal policy and regulatory landscape on a global level, um, as well as on domestic levels for different countries in order to identify opportunities to advance protections for fungi. Now it's a top down approach. We're not working with municipalities for them to do it, although many municipalities have already caught on, caught on and are using this mycologically inclusive language. We're really aiming at countries and at global agreements. Um, we aim to engage governments and we want to participate in governance processes to advance the interests of fungi. Now the interests of fungi here represent um, you know, some could say, how, how do you know the interests of fungi? Well, of course, we don't know the interests of fungi apart from survival and reproduction, which we could infer from, from any life form. But what we do know is that unless more funding is allocated to research, to education, um, to protection, unless they are even named, unless we say their name, it will never happen. And what we are facing is that in most, actually in all, all international conservation frameworks, they are explicitly excluded because it refer, they refer to flora and fauna or to plants and animals and fungi are disregarded, they're not even acknowledged. So with interests of fungi, we mean at least saying their name. Now, what we've done um, is really call on state leaders, civil society, science, citizens everywhere, um, to help us revert the fact that in most of these environmental legislation and international assemblies that, uh, that this third F is, is absent. And by adding the third F, funga, to this list, what we would do is write this neglected kingdom of life into conservation and agricultural policy frameworks and unlock the crucial funding for mycological research, surveys and, and educational programs. And so through this manifesto, we call on the state leaders and others um, to really state the equal significance of fungi among the kingdoms of life, and also to help us address the threats that jeopardize the ability of many of the fungal species to thrive and survive. And, you know, the, the, the manifesto, this statement had huge traction. We are now um, over 2000 signatories um, from close to 80 countries. Um, there are institutions that have signed this manifesto. There are incredible mycologists like this gentleman with the red um, umbrella that you all know. Um, Dame Jane Goodall signed on. George Monbiot, uh, Donna Haraway, you know, Q, Q as an institution signed on. Even singers like Peter Gabriel, for those of you who might know him, he's a wonderful British um, a musician who, who also is a human rights activist and chefs um, working on fermentation um, like David Zilber and, and others signed on to this, um, this statement. Now, this is just the beginning, the signing, having this manifesto ready. And that's where the work of NYU School of Law really kicked in as, um, and, and the difference between having you know, a symbiosis with a school of law and by just by being an NGO and having symbiosis with mycologists is very evident. We've looked through and built a roadmap, a legal roadmap to, for, and a strategy to get this term that is already endorsed by, by influential people and institutions into regulatory frameworks. And we've looked through many, really dozens of um, treaties, agreements, conventions. And this is a list of some of them. Um, 
in the in in some cases just by approaching like in the case of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework um just the fact that we were bringing up that the wording was incorrect made them change flora and fauna and plants and animals to um, biodiversity at large so we could see that the effect you know the, the, there was an acknowledgement that, that the two f's and just by and just talking about animals and plants was was obsolete and was incorrect and instead of naming another kingdom of life they really just decided to include all organisms but one that really stands out as an example of how how neglected fungi are is cites now, CITES is the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species of, wait for it, wild flora and fauna. Now, this is the international body that regulates all the trade of any species that is listed within an IUCN red list. So, for example, um, if um, honestly here, if just by the, the name excludes fungi. So what happened in 1987, curiously, and here in Santiago, Chile, they had a meeting and they decided that fungi would be considered as plants. In 1987, we're going to consider fungi as plants in the treaty. So if anybody wants to propose a fungus, like for example, Ophiocordyceps sinensis, or, you know, a, a Trigoloma matsutake, you'd have to propose the species as a plant. Now, it does beg the question, would we try to ban ivory trade by proposing an elephant as a plant? Well, no, we wouldn't, right? It's incorrect. It's scientifically incorrect. And, um, well, I'll just leave it there because I start getting angry again. Um, so that's where we are today, for example, with CITES. And here's a clear example of where the three Fs would come in to very certainly um, change the name of the convention and open up the inclusion of fungi into this, um, this international um, governing body. Now, this, you know, the three F proposal caught on rapidly. And in, in July this year, um, we were, I was, honored and very happy to work with Danny Hillwaters, who um, is also part of the, Farm uh, the Farlow family, um, with Greg Mueller and Susana Gonzalez, to, uh, and we got this letter published in Science that was a follow-up to a letter by a group of Chinese researchers who had uh, pushed for the inclusion of um, microfungi in conservation priorities, but really what needs to happen is the inclusion of all fungi in biodiversity goals. Now this was a huge step because it helped us leverage the plan we had from the Fungi Foundation, and once again I just wanted to show the, the um, inter-country collaboration nature of, of this publication. Um, this really helped us go and speak to the um, the Chilean government and what we did and we had started working on this um, with NYU School of Law and, and with Merlin, uh, we managed to request and and get um, the Chilean government to back the 3F proposal. So this is a letter I received in mid-July where um, the Ministry of the Environment says that through this letter, they give their, um, their, um, uh, how would you say this? Um, when we say, um, I don't know the word, hold on, I'm losing my Spanish and English translation, but they basically sponsor, that they sponsor the 3F initiative and that the Ministry of the Environment um, will support this uh, as needed for a, a year. And this is because this initiative is of high value as an instrument of sensibilization, so to sensibilize and to promote um, the environmental sustainability of our country. Now, having the letter in science, the paper, the manifesto, Chile, um, Chile support led to the, one of the most incredible um, results of this campaign and it, this happened in August, early August of this year that the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, called for the recognition of fungi as a major component of biodiversity in legislation and policy. It fully endorses the Fauna Flora Fungi Initiative 
and ask that the phrases animals and plants and fauna and flora be replaced with animals, fungi and plants and fauna, flora and fungi. Now this is huge. There is a before and after of this um, uh, press release that was issued together with Rewild, which is the Chilean government and IUCN and the Fungi Foundation. Rewild is a large, huge global NGO co-founded by Leonardo DiCaprio. And what this actually means is that the biggest governing, the biggest um, environmental NGO that informs all of these treaties moves from the two F's to the three F's and formally includes um, fungi in its language. What happened is that IUCN started to say the name of the fungi and they transitioned from, you know, from this exclusive language to mycologically inclusive language. And this um, press release really had a, a big effect. It started replicating in different parts of the world, but um, it also um, as a call to countries and other organizations um, to recognize the fungi, it's, it had big media impact. Leonardo DiCaprio himself um, started promoting the 3F initiative. Now, we know that fungi have gone into the mainstream with the movie Fantastic Fungi and that psychedelics are really getting people talking about fungi, but that's not what we do as an organization. This is, this for us is really about global change. It's about writing fungi into legislation and provoking durable change um, in funding streams, streams and education opportunities. So Leo, uh, started tweeting about this and promoting it and, and even um, replicated videos um, where there is a, you know, there are really detailed explanations about what fungi are. And this translated into media like The Atlantic um, publishing this headline, you know, flora and fauna is so outdated. It's time to give fungi the respect they're due. I love this one. This is in August this year. The BBC also picked up with wherever it says flora and fauna, we need to say flora, fauna and funga. It's the third F. So this, this 3F initiative really, really has been successful. Um, what's next what we've been doing now is that um in during cop 26 there were several in glasgow the the climate the climate conference of the parties just this few weeks ago there were conversations about fungi more about applications of fungi but what's happening now is that um the convention on biological diversity of the united nations is our target um target in a good way we are planning to um, obtain um, formal pronunciation from the UN. Um, it could be a special report, it could be another way, but the next step is for the United Nations to um, issue um, a report and recognition of the 3F initiative to transition to mycologically inclusive language. And that said, next steps also include uh, herbarians to acknowledge that the mycological collection collections are fungaria, fungariums. Um, it requires natural history museums around the world to start including exhibits on fungi. Um, and believe me or not, it's incredible that one can go to the largest natural history museums in the world in some of the most developed countries. And if you're lucky, there will be a fungus somewhere. Um, so that's next on, on the list of um, things to change. And also um, the inclusion of mycology in um, high school, middle school and, um, and uh, primary school um, curricula as a mandatory topic around the world. So with that, I want to acknowledge Bola again. There she is. Uh, this is her college graduation project. And I want to say thank you, invite you all to support the foundation. Um, you can visit us on ffungi.org and you can find me always um, whenever you need me through the foundation or, or through the Farnham. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana. That, that was wonderful. 
Uh, and really enlightening, I think, for all of us to have this broad view of how this has worked into and uh, through the uh, policies. So um, we can open this up and uh, there may be questions and you can uh, type a question into chat or you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, you use reactions down at the bottom. And uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. What, what, what's stimulated you here to think about? Criticism is welcome also. <laughs> Should we not have come up with funga? It's hard to so say. Well justified there. So anything for Juliana? Me. Meredith, Meredith Blackwell, you'll have to unmute. Unmute. No, we need to there I go. Okay. Uh, here in the United States, at least it was this way a few years ago, uh, for science fair, where a lot of kids might get interested in fungi, they're not really allowed to um, do much for their, their presentations with having real fungi there. And does anyone have any ideas about this and know more about it than I do? Because it seems to be a, a place where, where kids kind of lose interest. And in, although there are lots of fungal projects early on, so, so they, nobody they for safety issues, maybe. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. They're afraid of fungi. People, the organizers are apparently afraid. Yeah. And this is the way it was in Baton Rouge. And I don't know if it's all throughout the country, but uh, but it certainly was with kids I helped. Yeah. So they had the, to have photographs. It, it's 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 incredible, and I'm so glad you brought that up. And also, have, I'm going to have another fan moment for Meredith. Sorry, have to do it every time I see you. Um, the um, fungi, every in most places in the world, um, in the Western world, are associated with decay, death, rot, and therefore the end. Right, the end of of a life form. And it's really take. We've had to take on a um, a role in educating that the end of a life form is the beginning of many other life forms really that linking recycling you know and your compost in your home to the to to what fungi do i think there's a, a huge void in communicating that fungi are more than poisonous toadstools and that in fact they're in every you know in so many parts of our everyday life i think it's a communications issue because once you communicate for example well, you know, there's this wonderful book called Into the Wild by John Krakauer. It's a movie too. And it shows this young man who went off to live, you know, in Alaska, who gets caught up in the winter and he sleep, he has to live in a bus and he got his plants mixed up and he died. I mean, you know, he, he very quickly was poisoned from plants that he got wrong. And we, we use things like that, a very trendy book and film to show that really this deadly feature of misidentification and therefore dying or getting ill is to all the kingdoms of life, right? All these macroscopic kingdoms, you, you know, you, you touch it, the wrong frog and you, you know, goodbye. So, so the, the efforts of communicating is what, um, it's, it's basically misinformation, misconception of what fungi are that leads to these huge frights that, you know, they're dangerous, you can't have them there. Um, but it's it's common in different countries and really tackling this, tackling um, the, the, the wonder of decay and the commonality of poison, poisonousness among kingdoms is, is the way forward. Well, one, one more comment real quick and then I'll um, let other people talk. But a number of years ago, Dean Glavi, and I hear Dean's now retired, has suggested that we should have a Boy Scout uh, merit badge on mycology and so he's retired now and maybe he could be convinced by you or someone else to do it um, now and also include girls too 
Yes. Because I think that would be a really good way to get around some of this fear, maybe at a young age. Wonderful. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question here from a graduate student. What do you think the spillover is going to be in terms of jobs for mycologists and um, others? Wow, that's a great question. And actually, I have a great answer because Chile is proof that there is a spillover, that there is job creation. Now, we, here in Chile, we did things, some may argue, the wrong way around. A country where you can't study mycology, where there are very few mycologists, now there is a mandatory obligation to do um, fungal baseline studies, and therefore there are jobs, right? We need mycological consultants to do the baseline studies to get into the environmental impact assessments. But that drove the necessity of um, teaching, and, it, and it's been driving the necessity of getting the Natural History Museum to get the fungal collection in, you know, in a presentable fashion. Um, and, and for the botanists that are in charge of the mycological collection to start looking at the collection and, and, and having it available for people who need to look at them for reference. So there is a spill of, there is job creation when the policies are put in place for, um, for the acknowledgement or survey of fungi, um, having fungi included into education curricula around the world um, will definitely uh, um, need more mycologist training teachers, for example. So yes, it, it works. It's been working here. There are people who are employed all year round um, doing surveys. Great. Uh, you have a request to put up your initial slide again. Okay. And while you're doing that, I wonder, Susan, do you want to ask your own question here, Susan Goldhar? Um, yes, I, I can do that. I have to, I have to change my system, but the, I see two problems. And I, one is the problem that so many fungi are microscopic. Mm -hmm. And so people don't see them. I mean, they see monarch butterflies, they see polar bears, but mm -hmm. they don't see fungi apart from the charismatic mega fungi like mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And the other is that, that so many fungi are, are agricultural and forest pests. Mm -hmm. um, so when we ask people to preserve them, we're asking them to preserve uh, sort of enemies as well as friends. Well, I'm very glad that you only see two problems. That's the first thing I want to say, because sometimes there are people who see many more <laughs> big ones. But um, I, I I think, you know, both both of your very good points are common to plants and animals too. Um, you know, when, and, and you see entomologists really striving to get insects even separated from the term fauna. Um, you know, they want their own recognition because within fauna, they are, they're under, they're, they're overlooked. So I would say that, yes, we, we, we all use baobabs and redwoods and maybe you know a beautiful orchid and a rose to, to think about plants nobody really uses a liverwort or you know or a moss or, or a fern unfortunately and and with animals it's the same you know we're not using slugs to to get the point across we're using this large charismatic megafauna and in the case of fungi it may well be that we're using you know the bolites and the amanita muscarias or all these wonderful look at this i mean just this wonderful array of of um of organisms but because the terms refer to um to kingdom diversity it's uh, that they're included they're included with the inclusion of the term um and then with the with the point of of the pests absolutely and and once again it's common for example to to the to the animals i mean the the bugs are are um are demonized in in agriculture and um you know it's 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 about communication it's about removing the exclusivity of these 
um, these features of these negative features from fungi. Fungi are demonized. They are they are unjustly demonized as if they are the only kingdom that has the attributes of being a pest for for a crop um, or or for being um, poisonous to humans. So there, there I think I, I think just in response to both both points, communications is the key. Great. Uh, you have a supporter here, uh, Girl Scout programmer, also teach fungi at a natural history museum. So oh, wow. I would love to see these things happen in the States. So good support there. Wonderful. If you could leave your email in the chat, that would be great. I have to acknowledge that um, Christian Moreno, who's worked with me for nine years and is, is connected from London is on the chat. So a huge shout out to Christian. He does a lot of the hard work that's shown in this presentation. <laughs> yeah. Little little technical question here uh, about lichens. Do you want to put them in two, two kingdoms? Or do you want me to answer that one? You can answer that one, Don. Yeah, all the, the taxonomy, the fungi are uh, the fungus of the lichen is that that is uh, considered the uh, name bringing the kingdom assigned uh, in that way. So uh, just one kingdom and not all algae or plants either. We have proteists there yes. too. The red, uh, the, the red, yeah, the red ones. Yeah. Um, in drier climates uh, with low humidity, uh, how are fungi usually represented? Also, in the largest wetlands of the world, the uh, Pantanal, Pantanal uh, so close to Chile. Native fungi there? Yes, so that's that's a great question. I think Chile um, is still an untapped resource in in the sense of the ability to maybe draw some methodological lines of how we can appropriately survey fungi in arid re regions. So for example, the Atacama Desert in Chile, it's the driest desert in the world. Um, then you have, you know, Mediterranean climates, of course, there are wetlands, there are um, temperate rainforests all the way down to tundras, subantarctic. Now, what we've seen, actually, and this is it's wonderful that you bring this up, and, and I want to thank you uh, very much, Maristella, for that. Um, the, the inclusion of fungi as a requirement in baseline studies for the environmental impact assessment has driven that the companies searching for an environmental, seeking an environmental permit, big companies that want to make a development, build a highway, build a dam, right? Um, those companies f fund these surveys with independent um, contractors, um, consultants that are in a national registry. And they, they fund these, the field studies that are mostly um, two seasons a year, hopefully for two years, so four, four different um, uh, forays to document the fungal diversity. That has provoked an increase in the knowledge of the species found in the places where they're surveyed. And that those specimens, will, as a foundation, we've strived for those specimens to be deposited in Fungaria. Um, we, um, there's a, there, the information and the reports are public and we've been reviewing those reports, making sure that the species that are reported aren't species that are associated to plants and animals that aren't found in the country. And, um, and, and Christian, who, who's online, has, has, has led that work. And we've seen that there, the compliance hasn't been 100%. Um, some of the reports are not very good, but the, the questions of the diversity in these extreme places is being answered in many cases through the, the private funding of the baseline studies for environmental permits. So in the desert, for example, you mentioned in places, dry climates, it's one of the mining capitals of the world. So all these mining companies that want to extract either lithium or copper or whatever, they are funding these baseline studies and that information is public. So yes, there are um, many native fungi. There are many that are 
undescribed at the moment, for example, in the genus Diciseda with Francisco Cujar, we know we have um, close to a dozen of undescribed species of that genus alone, and that's thanks to baseline studies in the semi-arid areas um, where companies are searching for permits, that we've been able to find them. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, uh, Teresita? You're muted. Muted. muted, muted. You're muted. Then it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. First, I want to congratulate you for a wonderful and very comprehensive talk. Uh, and I wanted to ask you something. Uh, are there other countries trying to follow your example other countries in Latin America or in other parts of the world trying to follow your example uh, of having been so successful in having these policies uh, uh, accepted? Thank you, Teresita. Um, so the, the, the short answer is yes, there are other countries. Now, what's evident is that the work that we do at the Fungi Foundation is not something we could do if we were academics. The work of a nonprofit and the NGO sector is different than academia, and it's not a side job to working in a university or you know, a research institution. So the first thing that's happened is that new uh, fungal NGOs have been created. Argentina has uh, many and Argentina is really moving forward with proposing regional um, policies and, the, and there's been some some really really great success with Ongos de Argentina, Fundación Ongos de Argentina. Costa Rica has a fungal NGO, Paraguay, so uh, and, and in other places too. So what we see is that um, the example of having a non-profit dedicated to fungi has caught on and that's what's making um, the proposal of policies in those countries uh, a reality. Thanks. And I'd have to just to add to that, I'd have to say that, you know, as an example, scientists told us all that the black rhino was in big trouble. If we didn't do something about the black rhino, it was going to go extinct. But then it was the NGOs like WWF who took that information and translated that science to policy. That's the step that the Fungi Foundation, um, that's where we play our role. And that's where these organizations that are being created are playing the role from translating that science to policy. Great. Thank you. Other questions, other things? This is a good chance. Uh, I see River. Hi, Juliana. That Hi. was wonderful, a big eye opener for me. Um, Teresa told me about you, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I guess um, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly. You said like that something about when an assessment is, is done, it's two years or something like that. And I guess um, I wonder with so much unknown and also just how long it could take just to you know, tease apart all mycelial, you know, connections and everything. How is, how is that, how is that done? Or do you, do you foresee like the assessments taking longer, you know, being proposed to be longer mm -hmm. or? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's really, um, it's the biggest challenge is this methodology. And Don and I had worked, you know, we several several times we've been trying to get, you know, the, the opportunity for, for me to concentrate on proposing some global methodologies for this. But what what we've what we see here in Chile is that um, because in, in Chile fungi are so the country is very long and diverse. The biggest concentration of fungal species is in the center and south, where um, the seasons of, of um, sexual reproduction of these macroscopic fungi are fall and spring with the basically most of the species being visible in fall and um, and then a fraction in spring. So what we've been pushing uh, at least and what is 
these reports, these baseline studies that are given in are um, assessed by a multi um, agency commission or committee from, um, from from the government. So you have the agriculture uh, agency, you know, a diversity agency and others. We've been we've worked with them to really give them two things. One are the you know field guides that can help the people who are making the assessments. And the other are some species lists of what's known for the country that, that is not necessarily in this in a an, in a field um, guide. And at the same time, we've been training um, many people from these agencies to understand that the specific the specificity, for example, of the fungi with a host or with a symbiont. And so when we've done the analysis, what we see and what we make sure to happen is that we're not reporting species that are associated with a tree that's not present in the country. And we've been training um, a lot of the of the people who assess these reports to understand that and to and give them the material to reference. Now, the seasonality, what, what we've been able to um, to establish as as base basically appropriate is one full se fall season and one spring season and um that is sort of the the minimum that should be complied with for a certain place along with a bibliographical thorough bibliographical research so we've given these agencies the full list full lists of references of the materials per region, the books and the papers that should be listed in any report that comes in. Mm -hmm. That's as so that's as that's really the way it's working. It's it's helping them understand what's not acceptable and what should be considered when um, mm -hmm. when assessing a report. And then and Christian, who's been in charge of really reviewing all of the reports. Um, um, I, I don't have the numbers now, but the compliance in some of these cases has been very low. So, for example, we see that I think it's about 23%, uh, Christian, correct me if I'm wrong, 23% have an adequate um, uh, re um, s sort of research of the bibliographical um, information available. So, so then we give that back to the government and say, you know, you have a problem. What did happen early on was that a hydroelectric power plant um, the process was stopped because it didn't have a fungal baseline study. So we see that these things happen. I mean, if it's not included, the project won't go through the regulatory pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just starting to understand this. So wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, question from Roz. Um, Hi, Roz. <laughs> Fungi are increasingly popular. Interest is mostly in eating or in uh, medical aspects of fungi. Uh, it is an opportunity for me to promote the idea of the three Fs. Thanks. I think we all agree with you, Roz. Wonderful. It's great to, to have this, to be able to use this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And then for Brazil, yes. So Brazil, yeah. um, I have to say there's a wonderful group in um, in uh, the Universidad Federal Santa Catarina with uh, Maria Lise Neves and Ricardo Dreschler Santos. Ricardo leads the uh, IUCN um, initiative there and Maria Lise is a wonderful fungal conservationist. So there are people to to um to look to yeah good so this has been wonderful juliana uh well we're continuing here uh, yes <laughs> five kingdom classification of life uh so what happens to the status of fungi between then and now yeah well it's been odd about the way in which fungi have been recognized i think um very uh, interesting, and part of it is driven by 
the museum community and others where we tend to still follow Linnaeus and have animals and plants and uh, so forth. But uh, yeah, and I think they, you know, the frontier now is also these protists, these other organisms that are uh, out there and they're part of their own kingdom that haven't been addressed. Uh, questions are coming in uh, very quickly. Uh, so Christian has answered there. Um, the full compliance is 18.4%. Um, and that is our, our that's the foundation um, standard. So with two years, so four seasons, they don't comply with that. That's not mandatory. And and just as a, as a parenthesis, there are a lot of people who reach out to us and say, you're advocating for the fungi. What about you know the protests? And my loving answer is, if anybody wants to take that on, we will help. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, then the question of rarity and mm -hmm. so forth. How can this be determined? Well, so so um, what happens? That, that it doesn't go that far. Because the reports are public, a researcher can, or anybody, an academic, anybody interested can, can download those, can have access to the species list, can, um, you know who did them, you can require the specimens, and then that will be taken on by other groups. Great. Okay, We've, uh, we're about uh, 510. I know you all have Thanksgiving preparations to uh, work on and think about. In a normal year, I would be inviting you to a reception in the room that you see behind me, the wonderful Farlow Reference Library. I'm sorry I can't do that, but I do thank you all for being here. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to think about these things and have the expertise of Juliana to share with everyone. So thank you, Juliana. This was great. And thank I know that every, everybody is uh, joining in now in the chat to thank you. It's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you, Don, for always believing in my work and in the foundation. And really, after 23 years, I thanks to you, I have been able to take a mycology course. And that's and so thank you very much from being self-taught now to having your support. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll leave now. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.